So let's just kind of review where we are. So we talked about taxonomy in general. Then we started talking about each of the kingdoms. We already covered archaea. We talked about bacteria. We talked about protists. We talked about fungi. We just finished plants. So that leaves us with just one kingdom left to talk about, animals. And we're going to spend a couple weeks probably talking about animals, um, doing a few different activities and things like that. So before we really get into talking about individual types of animals, we're going to get it, we're going to talk about some general characteristics that we need to think about when we are categorizing animals. So first of all, you guys already know, what are the three words that we use to describe the characteristics of animals? Eukaryotes. So they're eukaryotes, multicellular, which one? I heard both. Heterotrophs. So they are made of many cells. Their cells have a nucleus, and they obtain their energy by eating other things. Those are the three characteristics of all animals. So within the animal kingdom, we can kind of think about them as a couple big groups. Some animals have a backbone, okay, like these vertebrae. We are animals with a backbone. We call them vertebrates. We are vertebrates. But there are also many, many animals. They don't have a skeleton inside of them. They don't have a backbone. And we call them invertebrates. So we're going to start with um, the invertebrates in this unit and spend some time talking about different types of invertebrates because there's a lot of interesting um, animals that are part of that group. Okay. So, vertebrate or invertebrate? Yeah, that's a vertebrate. Um, a frog is what type of vertebrate? Yeah. So there's five classes of vertebrates. What is a frog? What like category? What do we call frog or a toad or a salamander? They're amphibians. Yeah, What about this? It's a worm. Vertebrate or invertebrate? Invertebrate. Invertebrate. A worm, soft body, it has no skeleton inside of it. It's an invertebrate. A lobster? Vertebrate. Invertebrate. It's a vertebrate. It's a vertebrate. So a lobster has a hard exoskeleton on the outside. But if you've ever eaten a lobster, a whole lobster, are there any bones inside of it? No. No. Lobster is an invertebrate. It has no backbone. Obviously. Polar bear. Why is it like? Let's look at some other examples. So this is the one people always make a mistake on. It's a vertebrate. It's a reptile. Snakes are vertebrates. <coughs> A crab? Vertebrate. In, invertebrate. Invertebrate. Uh, is it just like vertebrate? Starfish? No, invertebrate. Invertebrate. An ant? A vertebrate. An ant? That's fine. Vertebrate. Who's confident in their answer and, and is pretty sure they you. know? Matt? Vertebrate? Nope. No backbone in an ant. What? Vertebrate. Mouse has a backbone. Vertebrate. Salamander does. No. A slug? No, no. No. Invertebrate. No. Invertebrate. All right. So we're going to be spending some time talking about these invertebrates over the next few days. And one of the ways we categorize different types of invertebrates is by what we call their symmetry. Now, you may have studied symmetry in math class. You might have talked about the symmetry of different shapes. What does symmetry mean? Like what, when you talk about the symmetry, what are you referring to, Kendall? Equal on both sides. Yeah, sort of its pattern of how it's set up. Okay? It's the arrangement of parts. And when we talk about animals, 
we can say some animals have asymmetry. That means they have no patterns at all. They're just sort of a random shape. You can't split it into equal halves at all. Like this shape is, has asymmetry. Do we have to draw that? Just draw some random shape, yeah, that has no symmetry. Can I draw a circle? Other organisms have what we call bilateral symmetry. What does the prefix bi mean? Two. two. And lateral means side. So two sides. Something with bilateral symmetry is basically the body is set up so it has two equal sides. Rectangle. We are, we have bilateral symmetry. You draw a line down the middle of yourself, you have an eye on each side, an ear, Half your nose, half your mouth, an arm, two legs, a leg on each side. So that's an example of bilateral symmetry, two equal halves. The third type of symmetry is called radial symmetry. Radial. What kind of shape would you measure the radius of? A circle. A circle. Radial symmetry is circular symmetry. It's a pattern when the organism arranged around a circular pattern. So like a flower has radial symmetry. It's arranged in a circular pattern. With radial symmetry, you can draw several lines dividing it into equal parts. And so as we talk about the different types of invertebrates, we are going to talk about what type of symmetry they have. Because all vertebrates have what? All vertebrates have what type? Bi Bilateral symmetry. So what does this, this insect have? Bilateral. Bilateral. has two equal sides. You draw a line right down the middle. What's on each side is equal. This sea anemone. Radial. That's radial. Again, it's like spokes on a, on a wheel. It's arranged in a circular pattern. And then this? Asymmetry. Yeah, that's asymmetry. There's no real pattern there. You couldn't draw any line splitting it into equal parts. Can I go? In the invertebrate, it would be Yep. We'll talk about some. So here's some more organisms. And some of these are invertebrates. And they do have bilateral. So this cat. Bilateral. Bilateral symmetry. You draw a line right down the middle, and it's two equal sides. Raise your hand. What about this spider? What kind of symmetry does a spider have, Matt? Radial? No, it's not quite radial because you can only draw a line one way, splitting that in half. That's bilateral. What kind? Of, what do we? What do we call this? Um, an amoeba. Raise your hand and tell me. Right? Asymmetry. It doesn't have any pattern. Now this you may have seen near the ocean. It's um, a sea urchin. Oh, I actually they're spiky. Yeah, they're spiky. But if you ever look at them carefully, what type of symmetry they have, Kendall? Um, that's uh, radio. Radio. Yeah. Radio. All those spikes are arranged in like circular pattern around that sea urchin. How about, this is called a planaria. It's a flatworm. We will look at them next week. Connor, what type of symmetry is that? Bilateral. Bilateral. Yeah, you can draw a line right down the middle. You have two equal sides. You know what this is? It's a jellyfish. It's a horseshoe crab. Oh. I'm actually Nate, what kind, what kind of symmetry is that? Bilateral. Bilateral. Two equal sides. Abby, how about the sand dollar? Not quite. Which is called what, James? It's radial. radial symmetry. So yeah, it's like smoke telling you. It can draw several lines splitting it into equal parts. And then finally, the starfish. What type of symmetry does the starfish have, Haley? What's that? No, it has radial. Because those arms of the starfish are kind of like spokes coming out of the wheel. 
Okay, it's like a circular pattern. But if you want to split it in half, couldn't it be by rail? No, because you could split it this way. You could split it this way. You could split it this way. And you always went up to equal halves. So you can split it like three different ways. So that's a sign of radial symmetry. With these bilateral organisms, you could only draw a line one way to have two equal sides. Which one? No, because like if you draw a line through this and splitting these in half, or you can do the same thing this way, or you can do the same thing this way. You know, you can All right, so we're going to start talking about invertebrates. Again, these are animals that don't have a backbone. They don't have a spinal column. Now what do you think? Are most animals that we've identified vertebrates or invertebrates? Emma, what do you think? Vertebrates. They're actually not. Vertebrates are only about 5% of the animals that have been identified. 95% are actually invertebrates. Any idea what the biggest group would be? Dinosaurs. No, invertebrates. Insects. Insects, yes, insects are a huge group, and there's a huge number of different types of insects. And again, those are all invertebrates. And invertebrates go from very simple things, like the sponge, to much more complicated organisms, like this crab. And we'll talk about a bunch of different groups. Gavin? Is like that sponge, like, does that like turn into like the sponge that you used to No, we're, let's talk about it. So we're going to go through now, through several phylums. So again, we're in domain eukarya, kingdom, animal. Within that phylum, we're going to name several different phyla of invertebrates. The first one are the simplest animals. It's called phylum porifera, and these are sponges. Now, when we say sponge, we're not talking about like a rectangular, bright pink sponge that you have at your sink in your kitchen. That's artificial. That's just made of foam and air. But there are natural sponges. Have you seen stuff like this before? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, you might have it like a shower or bath. It's um, sometimes called a lupa. These are actually the remains of an animal. There, this was once a living animal. All the living parts are gone. This is just kind of its, its skeleton that's left over. And it can absorb a lot of water. It's got lots and lots of little tiny holes in it. This is a sponge. It's squishy. Okay. I'll pass it around. It's kind of soft. If I put water in it, it would be much squishier. You can pass it around. Just don't break it, please. Um, and so, hold on one sec. Yep. What type of symmetry? Oh, it would be asymmetry. Asymmetry. It has no real pattern to this. Oh. It's asymmetry. And the way that sponges actually eat, is they're what we call filter feeders. What, what does that mean, oh, if they're yeah, a okay. filter? Oh, here, they um, Tatum? Don't they, like, eat, like, from the water? Like, don't they, like, regular Yeah, they, they basically suck water in through all these tiny little holes, these pores, and as the water is going through them, they're filtering out little tiny bits of plants and animals and organic matter, and that's what they consume, okay? And then as that water leaves, they filter it out, and that's how they got their energy. These are usually in the ocean. They're usually attached to the ocean floor, and they basically stay there, sucking water in, and that's how they get nutrients. Wait, can you them? Yeah, you could. Like, you could like dig a hole just like this. Yeah. Like, yep. Um, so sponges like that, they when they're alive, they come in a huge variety of colors and shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. You know, some are blue like this one. And again, you could see it at the tiny little holes where water goes in, and on this sponge, it then squirts the rest of the water out the top, filtering, getting little bits of food along the way. Again, here's a variety of different types of sponges. Some are shaped like tubes. What's that? That's it. It's like skeleton, basically. Okay, so these are all examples of sponges. Again, huge variety of shapes and sizes and colors. And these are the simplest of animals, but they are animals. 
They're heterotrophic. They're multicellular. They're eukaryotic. They have all the characteristics of, um, of animals. Another phylum of invertebrates are the nidarians. Phylum nidaria. This includes things like jellyfish, coral, hydra, sea anemones. Does anyone have any experience with a jellyfish, a type of nidarian? Jane? Um, have you seen them or yeah. interacted with them? Where? Yeah, in my yard, I see a big one, or like a big swan, and on a beach, a beach hut. I used to go on the shore, and I find little like clear jelly things, mm -hmm. and then when I uh, noticed they were jellyfish, I'd throw them back into the water. Oh, really? Abby? It's kind of like James said, it's a hope there. Yeah, we, we go to South Carolina each spring, and where we go along the shore every single day, there's dozens of jellyfish wash up on the shore. Has anyone had an experience with a live jellyfish that was painful? Well, I just went through the soft bulb and I pulled one out of the ocean that, like, shriveled up. Oh, really? Yeah. Gavin? Um, so, I was in the little beach, and then... I was like catching waves. I, I think I went out too far and I felt a stain. And I ran out of water, but and then I went back in and then it got washed up to shore. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so jellyfish have special cells in their tentacles. So the Darians have tentacles, and on those tentacles are these special cells. They're called nematocysts. And these cells basically shoot out from the tentacles into an organism, and they have sort of a, um, almost like a, a poison, which in small animals can kill them, and that's what the, that's what the jellyfish eat. In us, usually it just hurts or stings really bad. Um, but those cells are meant, they allow the jellyfish to hunt. Okay. And they have, what type of symmetry? Um. A jellyfish? Yeah. Radial symmetry. This is one we're going to look at. This is called a hydra. We'll see them next week. And hydra, um, they're small. We'll look at them, like, them under the microscope. But at the top, they have their tentacles. And then this long sort of stalk of a body here. Jellyfish, obviously. Some jellyfish even produce light inside of them. And they sort of glow. Often some that live deep down in the ocean where there's no light make their own light. Also anemones. Okay. Does anyone know anything about the clownfish and a sea anemone? You can see Nemo, but they have an interesting relationship. Abby? They live in the um, Yeah, so the, the clownfish sort of stays in the tentacles of the anemone, and it has a special sort of coating that the nematocysts don't sting it. But they do sting other fish. And so other fish will not go into the anemone because they don't want to get stung by it. And so it provides protection for the clownfish. So um, the clownfish aren't affected. They're not affected by it at all. Yeah. Um, this is another anemone. Okay, you can see they're on like a stalk, and these are their tentacles at the top. Jellyfish, and they stay prey and then eat them and consume them. The radial symmetry. You'll see them in wash up on the shore if you're ever at the beach. Sometimes they're in the water, and that's when people once in a while get stung by them. Um, there are some types of jellyfish that are strong enough to actually kill a person. Not that they're generally found around places we would go, but there are some very, very strong um, Poisons or toxins in those jellyfish tentacles. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, Australia thing has them. Yeah. All right, so that's another group, the Nidarians. So it's sponges, very, very simple. Nidarians, also pretty simple organisms. The next group are called echinoderms. And echinoderms, the name itself, like a dermatologist is a doctor that helps people with what? Skin. Their skin. Derm means skin. Echino means spider.
spiny. So they're naming spiny skin. These have spines or a hard exoskeleton. Examples are sand dollar, starfish, sea urchins. And these organisms, these echinoderms, um, they are usually filter feeders, some of them. They take in water, filter little bits of food out, like the sand dollar. Sand dollar is an actual animal, so you may have seen them like in a story to buy a sand dollar shell. But they were once alive. They move around in the sand. I'll show you in a minute. They move around. They filter out bits of food from the uh, from the water. Sea urchins have all those spikes on them for protection. Starfish are neat too. You know, fishermen um, are thought to at one time, as they're fishing, trying to catch fish. If they caught starfish, they would often be annoyed because can't really eat starfish. And so they chop them up into pieces and throw them back in the ocean. Just to get rid of them. Or that's what they thought. But jellyfish, I mean um, starfish, have this ability to regenerate. If you cut this starfish in pieces, any piece that has a section of this central disc area will grow into a whole new jellyfish. So if you chop this up into three pieces and throw it back in the ocean, eventually it's going to have as three new starfish. So obviously cutting them up and throwing them back wasn't destroying them, it was just making them reproduce. Kendall? My dad was snorkeling one time, and the, a wave like pushed him into a sea urchin, and he got like the whole thing, and hand and then like when it goes like in the it like goes like that, so it can get off, so they just cut the tops off, so you just see it, and it's Oh yeah. Yeah, they're, they're very sharp, those, those uh, sea urchins. I'll right, show you, this is how the um, sand dollar moves. It's kind of neat to see. But because people think they're just like stuck there. Wait, what is it? That's a sand dollar. It looks like so it's alive. It moves. Yeah, it's alive. It moves. It's an animal. Okay. Eventually, once they die, you know, the living parts die off, and all you're left is that white, like, exoskeleton that's left. Oh, I have one of those. Yeah. But it yeah, it goes in circles and it just gets little bits of food out of the sand and that's it's that's what it eats. That's all those pulls that it can Basically. So it's called the life kind of around each is this kind of like Mr. Arcari. Is this time lapse? Yeah. yeah. All right. So you're always nice to him. Yeah, that's time lapse. All right. So um we will continue on tomorrow.